Hello everyone and welcome back to Franchi Talks Asian Arts. I'm Franchi and I'm back with a new video. Now, if you watched my last video, I dropped some kind of little hints about what today's video would be about. And yeah, I kept my word and today I want to talk about the Gaia Confederacy, a confederacy of or an alliance of city-states which um, evolved in the southern area of the Korean Peninsula around the beginning of the Common Era. And I also want to look at the artifacts and the objects which they produced. In one word, my favorite word, their material culture and how we can learn about the Gaia Confederacy and its culture through their material culture. <laughs> now, if you are new to Korean history, Korean art, maybe you subscribe to my channel because I talked about Japanese art <laughs> recently, so Korean art is new to you, but just keep watching because uh, Korean art is somewhat new to me as well, especially Korean history and archaeology. Actually, I was inspired to make this video by a trip which I took in a, a few months ago and where I went to visit the town of Haman in the southern coast of South Korea. When I was visiting Haman, I visited its archaeological sites, its museums, and I was kind of catapulted into this new culture, this new historical era or historical state which I didn't really know about previously. And so when I got back home, I, I found it really fascinating. So I started reading about it. And here is what I was reading, if you want to know. This is uh, Gaia Spirit Iron and Tomb. It's very hard to see because it's so bright, the cover, so white. But it's a catalog from the uh, National Museum of Korea and it was an exhibition, it's the catalog for an exhibition which they organized about the Gaia Confederacy and also the, the main catalog for the National Museum of Korea which of course talks about all the artworks which are in the collection including uh, objects from the Gaia Confederacy. And so while I was reading these books, these catalogs, I thought to make a video about this topic, to take you kind of on a similar journey to the one that I did and to learn about the Gaia Confederacy, to look at their objects, uh, ceramic and ironware, their material culture and what we can learn about them from those objects. Before we start, I just wanted to drop a reminder here that if you enjoy the video while you're watching it, if you feel like you're learning something, you can decide to support the channel. There's very easy ways to do so. For example, clicking like, um, subscribing to the channel, sending the video to a friend that you think might be interested in it. And you can also choose to support economically by sending me a little tip through the website Ko-Fi. The link is in the description. But for now, enough with the talking and let's jump right in. The Gaia Confederacy was a an alliance of city-states or polities um, which was located, as we mentioned, in the southern area of the Korean Peninsula, in the region around the Nakdonggang River. These polities, these city-states, evolved out of already present loosely organized chiefdoms around the beginning of the Common Era and they lasted until the year 562. Now, not much of the history of Gaia has been recorded. There's some records about it in the Chronicles of Japan, the ancient text Nihon Shoki, as well as in the records of the Three Kingdoms, the Sangoji. However, there's no whole text about the Gaia Confederacy. So to learn about this, we have to kind of take a different approach or different approaches other than studying and reading. First, what we can do is look at what legends tell us. So the legend about the birth of the Gaia Confederacy says that in the year 42 of the common era, six eggs descended from the sky. 
and there was a message attached to these eggs that said that kings would be born out of them. And indeed, only 12 days later, men were born out of the eggs. The first to be born was a King Suro, who went to become the king of Gungan Gaia, which was the kind of leader of the leading state of the Gaia Confederacy. We should note that King Suro went on to marry He Hang Ok, who was a, a woman who had come from a very far away land, a territory called Ayuta, which is believed to be in the Indian subcontinent. Other than Suro, five brothers were born out of the eggs and they also went on to lead the other five states of Gaia, which include Aragaya, the seat of which was located in Haman, where I went to visit, and also Sogaya, Degaya, Seonsan Gaia, and Goryong Gaia. This is, of course, a legend, but there are some facts that we can deduce from this story. The first one is that Gaia was a confederacy of six city-states. All of them had an independent leader, yet they coexisted in peace. And the second fact that we can note is that the wife of the leader of the main polity of Gaia was, had come from abroad. So this kind of tells us that this was a society which was open to outsiders and had contact with foreign lands. While not much has been left when it comes to written records about the Gaia Confederacy, there's an abundance of something else. And this something else is objects, material culture, objects which were excavated from the tombs. And this is how we can find a kind of a second approach to learning about Gaia. We can um, analyze, look at their artifacts and kind of try to understand about their history and culture. And this is what we're gonna do in this video, that's my aim for today. And we're going to also kind of see if we can find in the objects, if we can reflect, find reflected or materialized these characteristics which I have talked about, which are this kind of openness and coexistence. First, let's define the burial sites where all of these objects have been found. These have been understood by archaeologists to be the burial grounds for Gaia's leaders and royal. At first, these burial sites were constructed with no notable external features. However, with time, around the 5th century, they, became to, they came to be uh, mounted tombs with very high mounds. And this is the kind of tomb which I went to visit in Haman on the Marisan mountain. And I have to say, it was really fascinating to be walking around these hills knowing that they were tombs of ancient royals and that in them incredibly precious artifacts and artworks had been found. We have to note that constructing such tombs was uh, not an easy feat, it required an incredible amount of effort and manpower. So this tells us that Gaia royals must have been quite powerful. And also we should note that Within some of the tombs of Gaia leaders, evidence of human sacrifice has been found. Usually, this consists of bodies of the entourage of the kings, which it had been decided that they would be buried along with the deceased royal. From the tombs of the most powerful leaders, beautiful jewelry has also been excavated. For example, in the tombs of Garaguk, these beautiful earrings, golden earrings were found, as well as uh, crowns. The earrings uh, are usually shaped as a thin ring with a kind of pendant uh, dangling from it, while the crowns came in a variety of shapes, and sometimes they have this kind of upright features. One of the most abundant finds from the tombs of Gaia is ceramic specifically a kind of dark grey stoneware. Stoneware means that it's a kind of ceramic which was fired at quite high temperatures, for example, 1000 to 1200 degrees. And we think that these ceramics kind of worked 
as a symbolical ritual value. In fact, we can think that the ceramics were used as for rituals, they were kind of ritual pottery, and these rituals worked in basically justifying the power of the deceased royal and also justifying the royal successors. When we think of these pottery, we should keep in mind that they are kind of precious in of themselves because they were produced by skilled craftsmen using uh, specific skills and techniques, for example, firing at high temperature and climbing kiln. But at the same time, we also have to keep in mind that most of these pottery were vessels used to contain something else and quite possibly precious foods and liquids. Amongst the wares most often found in Gaia tombs are mounted dishes and vessel stands. So I want to look at a few of them and we can compare how they were produced in different Gaia polities. The pottery of Aragaya in the Haman region, where I went on my <laughs> little trip, is distinguished by flame-shaped perforations, which are often featured on the vessel stands and on the feet of the mounted dishes. Amongst the ways of the Sogaya from the Jinju and Sacheon region, we find mounted dishes with flat bodies and feet with rectangular perforations. We also find vessel stands which widen at the base in a characteristic trumpet shape. If we look at wares from the Gaia, from the Gorong region, we find mounted dishes characterized by a short foot and rectangular perforations, which are also found on the cylindrical vessel stands. So we can see from these examples, each polity of the Gaia Confederacy seem to have produced similar uh, vessels, similar pottery wares, uh, kind of similar shapes in the similar style. However, they maintain some kind of unique characteristics, for example, in the perforations with which they decorated their vessels, or some shapes, like more trumpet shaped or more flat shaped. From this, we can understand that these polities, they shared much of their material culture. So we can assume that they shared a lot of their culture, knowledge and their rituals. However, the same term maintain some unique taste, a unique style. And so we can think that they also maintained a certain degree of cultural as well as political independence. There's another type of ceramic objects which has been found in the Gaia tombs. And these are object-shaped pottery, which basically means ceramic objects in the shape of everyday things. So, for example, boats, houses, shoes. These everyday objects, ceramics, can tell us and can reveal to us things about the understanding of the afterlife by the people of Gaia. For example, it seems that, apart from jewelry, swords, ritual pottery, everyday objects were a necessity in the afterlife of the Gaia people. But they can also give us a glimpse into the everyday life of the people of Gaia. For example, what their shoes would have looked like, what boats would have been used for traveling and trading, and what kind of boats were anchored in their harbors. And again, pottery objects shaped like warriors can tell us what kind of equipment a Gaia warrior would have been able to wear and use. But Gaia tombs didn't just yield ceramic objects. There was another material which was produced in large quantities and was considered so precious to be put in the bodies of Gaia leaders, and that was iron. Iron actually played a huge role in Gaia politics economy and culture. And in fact, the craftsmen who were active in the territories of the Gaia polities used advanced techniques to create iron wares such as weapons and armors. And Gaia became known as the first producer and exporter of iron. Iron ingots were so precious that they were used as a currency at the time. It was very interesting to me when I read that 
the tombs of iron workers have been found in Gimhei, the seat of Gumguan Gaia, and in these tombs, um, objects related to iron working were found, such as hammers and big nails, but at the same time, uh, more precious objects, such as swords, were also excavated. And swords were a weapon, but they were also worked as a status symbol, especially straight iron swords with a ring pommel, which were often decorated with gold and elaborate decorations of animals and dragons. And these kind of weapons were also especially precious when they were gifted to people by a Gaia royal, the kind of work as a signifier of so where he stood in the hierarchy of the state. And so it was very interesting because it signifies that iron craftsmen were considered specialized, skilled workers and so enjoyed a high status in society. Weapons were, of course, a main iron production. Like we mentioned, uh, there were swords, but also spears, which are believed by historians and scholars to have been the main weapon when it came to fighting by Gaia warriors, the main used weapon. And also there's this kind of weapon that has been found, which is a kind of saw knife that are used, is still not entirely understood by uh, scholars and archaeologists, so there's this belief that they may have been used for ritual purposes. I know this is kind of a cliche by archaeologists to say this has ritual purpose. But anyhow, they were made up of this rectangular plate and they were decorated around the edge, usually with this kind of bird-shaped elements. The decoration on the edge also depended on the Gaia polity in which they were produced. Along with the weapons, also iron arm armors have been found in the tombs, both human har armors and horse armor. Horse armor is very impressive if we think about it, this kind of full horse armor. They must not have been easy or cheap to make. And so they proved to us that the manufacturing techniques of the Gaia Confederacy were on par with those of the neighboring states, such as the Three Kingdoms, which we, with which Gaia was in conflict. And the horse armor also makes us reflect on the military prowess of the states of the Gaia Confederacy, which, as we can understand, they were able to deploy heavy cavalry in their battles. We can also remember the ceramic vessel shaped like a warrior. We can see that both the warrior and the horse are covered in armor. Human armor started appearing in the Gaia Confederacy around the 4th century CE and it came mostly in two types, plate armor and lamellar armor. Plate armor consisted of several oblong iron plates connected by leather cords or iron nails. And these armors, they varied a bit in the style of the decoration. They could go for more, from more basic ones to ones that featured beautiful decorative shapes as well, such as bracken-shaped patterns. But from the late 4th century, lamellar armor also emerged and it became more popular from the 5th century. Lamellar armor consists of small scales connected by leather cords. Actually, plate armor came in two styles. <laughs> the main ones which I've talked about feature oblong rectangular plates which are placed vertically, but there was another style which developed which actually featured horizontal plates. And this kind of armor with horizontal plates is known as a Japanese style armor. These are found in the Korean Peninsula, mostly in the southern area, so in the territory of the Gaia Confederacy, although they've also been excavated from the territories of Shila and Baekje. And this Japanese style armor kind of raises some questions in archaeologists. For example, were the people interred with Japanese-style armor actually originally from the Japanese archipelago? 
or I these armors simply have been traded and then adopted by local readers of the Korean peninsula. But what we know, even though we cannot answer exactly all of these questions, is that the Gai Confederacy heavily traded with other countries, including but not limited to the Japanese archipelago. So this is kind of the last topic, the last section of today's video, in which I want to talk about how Gaia interacted and traded with other lands, with other people, and how we can understand this from material culture. If we look at, uh, again, <laughs> burials and the tombs of Gaia leaders, we can see, for example, that in the area of Gungwang Gaia, a large quantity of boat shaped ceramic objects have been excavated, and these depicted a trading boat with which Gaia would have done its trading, its business, and which would have been harbored in the ports of these polities. At first, uh, the exchanges of the Gaia Confederacy were limited to the Japanese state of Uwa, and for example, Japanese style sue ceramic wares, as well as Japanese stone arrowheads and uh, Japanese pinwheel-shaped shield ornaments have been found in Gaia burials. The pinwheel-shaped ornaments are interesting, I had never seen them before, but actually it is believed that this shape originated by a type of shell which was considered very precious in Okinawa because it is believed that it uh, protected from evil spirits. And then the same shape was made out of bronze and it was found in the tombs, in the coffin tombs of the most powerful Japanese leaders. So finding it in uh, Gaia actually has a strong significance. Another polity which strongly rose to trade was Aragaya. And also we have to say that um, the trading routes expanded. They weren't only limited to Japan, but the trade also expanded northwise, for example, with China. And so Chinese cauldrons, bronze mirrors, coins, belt buckles were all found in the tombs of the Gaia polities. And also we have to note that there were also some objects in less large quantities from West Asia, for example, beads and glassware. We should also note that trade didn't only happen by importing wares through boats. But for example, in today's Gimhe, at the time the seat of the Gumguan Gaia, actually there has been found evidence of settlements where the Japanese people had come from the Japanese archipelago and then moved to and settled in Gaia. For example, uh, quite a large amount of Haji pottery has been found and these were everyday pottery used by Japanese people. And we can deduce that these people had moved to Gaia to facilitate trade with the state of Wa. So I find it really fascinating how these objects of trade can materialize in front of our eyes actually how open and almost i would like to say cosmopolitan the the state of gaia was well the states of gaia were showing us that they were open to trade they were connected with other people other lands and also that they created a kind of more cosmopolitan society in which people from abroad could come, live and work. So on this note, I would like to conclude this video. I hope that you enjoyed watching it. And as always, thanks for watching. Let me know what you think in the comments. It was my first time making a whole video about Korean history and art. So I hope it uh, came out well. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, remember that you can click like, leave me a comment or subscribe to the channel if you want to see more and you can consider supporting the channel by sending a little tip to the website ko-fi the link is in the description but for now i would just like to say thank you for watching and i hope to see you again soon bye